Have you ever heard the saying there's not much more expensive than a cheap German car? Well, I just bought this 06 Touareg with 121,000 miles on it for 4,500 bucks. So in this video, we're gonna shake down this Touareg. I'm also gonna give you some really common things to look for if you're considering buying a Touareg, or maybe that'll help you stay away from buying a Touareg. A lot of this is also gonna apply to Porsche Cayenne, and I'm sure we're gonna find some good stuff as we move along with this 17 year old car. This 2006 Touareg that I bought, it's the V8 engine with steel suspension, which in my opinion is one of the best overall powertrains. It was also offered in a V6 version as well as a V10 TDI. This is not a car that's gonna get driven every day, so I wanted to stay away from diesel. It's also pretty well equipped with parking aid, heated rear seats, and I'm sure a whole slew of electrical gremlins that I've yet to even discover. Now what's cool about this SUV is you can get them super cheap and they still are actually decent. It's become very popular to buy these for a couple grand, throw some Eurowise off-roading parts on it, and have an incredibly capable off-road vehicle. In fact, out of everything that's happening in the VW Audi Porsche space right now, off-roading these things is kind of my favorite. So under the hood, we have the V8. We'll go ahead and check our air filters. These were actually kind of a pain in the butt to even get to. One thing I just did notice is right here, I have a broken vac line from the vacuum pump to the brake booster. All this, all this. Oh, look, this is off too. Uh, so that, that's probably not good. Good thing we checked it. There's also a secondary air line down here at the bottom. If you have air ride, there's gonna be a hose right here at the back of this air filter. I'm probably not gonna pull both of these unless this is real dirty. We'll add air filters to the list at some point. There's a few big things on this engine you wanna look at. One is gonna be oil leaks. 1.5 is gonna be broken engine covers. It's actually completely irrelevant. Everybody on Mark 8 whines about not having an engine cover. Clearly never dealt with a Torag. Like all VWs, PCV valves can be an issue. Here at the front, this manifold has intake runners. This is a common failure point. The manifold seizes and these arms break. They make a metal repair kit for it, but if the manifold is seized, it doesn't matter. You put the metal repair kit on it, it's not gonna do anything for you. Probably one of the bigger concerns of this engine is going to be timing belt. This car, uh, it said it had a timing belt. I forget what the mileage was. Looks like we could probably stand a new water pump pulley. This car came from Pennsylvania, so there's a lot of oxidation and kind of rusty bits. You can see that right there. We got some marks here. Uh, we've done a timing belt at some point. That may be a video worth me doing to show you how to do it. This is a super easy timing belt to do, but it will be expensive if you pay someone else to do it. Along with timing belt issues, these are timing chain driven on the backside and timing chain tensioner, tensioner gasket failure is somewhat common too. This one does have a bit of rattle at cold start, so we may be addressing that at some point too. There's also a fair amount of vacuum lines on this engine. I haven't seen a ton of those fail, but anytime you have a vacuum line, you have a potential failure point. Now the interior on these holds up exactly like all VWs of this vintage kind of terrible. You can pretty much expect every button that might get pushed to have the majority, if not all, of the soft touch coating peeling off. And if it's not peeling, it's nice and sticky and gross, especially when it gets hot. Now for what I'm gonna be using this for, which is gonna kind of be a beater to replace that Tacoma that I had, I don't really care about that. Also, this came with some weird aftermarket radio that didn't quite work right, so I'm test fitting this radio, which is why it's sticking out. There's a bunch of wires back behind it that I need to fix. You also wanna take a good look at the headliner, because I guarantee guarantee at some point every Torag has had some kind of water leak. You can see the evidence here on the headliner, which is also completely floppity and hanging down. I don't know if this water leak has been fixed, but the headliner's got to come down anyway, so that'll be something we address at a later date. Really, if you're buying one of these and you're going through the interior, hit all the buttons. Make sure everything works. I do have some headlight range control warnings coming on that I haven't really dug deep into yet. The biggest thing on the interior, push all the buttons and make sure things work. And if they don't, use it as a leverage point to save some money on the car. We also have the strap in both the glass hatch, which check it out, the glass opens separate in this one, as well as the main hatch. You know, you could open the glass and then open the trunk and then close them both together. I mentioned this one had an aftermarket radio and there was some pretty sad wiring back at the back near the amplifier. The amplifier was actually bypassed and the radio sounded like absolute trash. So I fixed all that. I'm still fighting some trailer issues because my trailer has LEDs. Now this generation Torag had bulb monitoring. So if a bulb went out, you knew it, but they hated trailers with LEDs. R15 TDI, no problem at all, but these, 
it doesn't work right. You get all kinds of weird warnings and all the lights of the trailer just stay on all the time. If you know a fix of that, actually let me know because I still haven't figured it out. I even tried that little adapter thing for bulb monitoring cars. So keep that in mind. If you have LED lights on your trailer like I do, this might be a really bad tow vehicle for you. Now you want to take a good look at the suspension on these, especially if you're dealing with air ride. I actually really don't love the air ride. If you want it, get it. It's awesome, but I don't love the idea of introducing a whole set of unnecessary problems for myself. And if you're going to lift it and do all that off-road stuff anyway, it might be worth just getting the steel suspension for it. Like many VWs, it also has a giantly obnoxious belly pan. Now that the belly pans are out of the way, let's take a look underneath this bad boy. You can see here's the oil filter. What a terrible place for an oil filter because you take this off and all the oil just goes spoosh, gets all in the subframe, which is why there's very minimal rust right here. I guess that's one plus. But yeah, the oil changes on these generally make a pretty big mess. The other cool thing is this actually has two drain plugs for the engine oil. One here, and you can see that looks pretty new. And then one up here, which looks pretty unnew. Uh, this is in the upper oil pan. It's a two piece or maybe even more oil pan. So this one usually gets forgotten about. When we do the first oil change, we'll probably take this one out too. You can also see that mine's pretty crusty, actually way crustier. And I don't even know why the heck I bought this knowing it's as crusty as it is, but it was a good deal at $4,500. So how much of this we're actually gonna fix? I don't know. I really don't know. And I know if you're like from the Northeast, you're saying that's not rust. I don't know y'all. This, this, uh, this is totaled for Southern rust. The biggest failure on this from a powertrain standpoint is going to be the prop shaft. More specifically, this carrier bearing right here. What happens is, is this little bit of rubber right here starts to tear. Then the whole prop shaft bangs up and down. It actually sounds like someone's underneath the car whacking it with a hammer. It's really loud. For the longest time, you had to get a prop shaft to fix that issue. Take the prop shaft out and replace it, which is not hard. You have a few bolts in the front. You have that bracket. Then you have the bolts at the back where it goes into the diff. Now I have on order a JXB Performance Carrier Bearing Repair Kit that we'll be doing on this at some point. Mine's not bad, but I want to test it out and do a video on how to do it. Otherwise, everything on these powertrain-wise is pretty good. I mean, again, mine's crusted out, which means I'm not sure how much we're actually going to address. We may just rock and roll it, but clearly our suspension is going to be worn out and that, uh, that, that might be a slippery slope that I don't really want to mess around with. We have a slew of other issues that might be a concern. Tire pressure monitors are probably not anymore because they've either just been turned off or whatever, but for a long time, tire pressure monitor issues were a thing on the early ones. This one actually doesn't have it, so no problem here. Blower motor failure on the newer ones is common. I just replaced the one on my TDI. On the TDI note, the AdBlue with the DPFs, a lot of them are out of warranty. You can probably expect some issues there. If you're having weird issues, there is a splice here on the driver's floorboard that a lot of times corrodes and fails, usually because it gets wet. If you pull this door sill off and go right here behind the carpet, like right where the dead pedal is, is, there's a splice that's poorly taped up. That's a really common failure point. So if you're having weird squirrely issues and it's not the battery, you might want to search there. The V8 of this generation had a recall to replace the cable from this jump start post around the back of the engine to the starter and to the alternator. They would get a high resistance and cause all kinds of wonky electrical issues. So we've just spent the last however much crapping all over this SUV, top to bottom, left to right. And I probably forgot 87 other things that are really problematic with these first generation, really the second generation Touareg as well. While the Porsche was very similar, it was a little bit different. So I don't know if all this stuff applies to Porsche as well, like it does Touareg, but assume so, and assume there's probably other Porsche special things that you want to account for. But is it worth buying one? Here's the deal. I love this generation of Touareg. So in my career, I grew up learning how to fix Volkswagens on these. So they always have a special place for me, but they are challenging. Now, if you buy one of these for three grand, four grand and want to just thrash on it, I love it. I love the Eurowise catalog of lift kits and skid plates and roofer. Dope, love it. However, the thing that everybody likes to forget when they buy a used German car is just because you paid three grand does not mean you're fixing and maintaining a $3,000 car. In today's dollars, this exact model 
is basically an $80,000 SUV. Ugh. You are still buying parts for an $80,000 SUV that likes to eat tires, likes to eat brakes, has all the peely stuff happening, the floppity headliner, all of it. I love how affordable these are right now. I love that you can buy one for three grand, take it and thrash it and not have to sweat that the instrument cluster MFI is all faded out, which is also a common problem. Just remember, it's not gonna be $3,000 car repair prices, it's gonna be $80,000 car repair prices. So what's gonna happen with this one in the future? I actually don't know after re-looking at all that rust. We might just leave it exactly how it is and do absolutely nothing. So I turn to you, what should we do with this exact 06 Torag? All right, as always, questions or comments, drop them down below with that, I'm out. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll talk to you again next time. Bye. That's 80,000 bucks gone. Where the f did you spend it? I bought a Torag. That's where, Luda. I bought a Torag.